welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 42. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We have got a concentration of Fair Isle Knitting and Shetland Tweed on the program today. We do. And many of you know that one of my very favourite knitwear designers is Marie Wallen. And Marie has recently designed a beautiful collection of Fair Isle garments called Shetland and she launched it in Shetland during the recent Wool Week. So during this time we got together to do an interview, which you're going to see today, and Marie shows us her collection, but she also talks a little bit about doing the photo shoot with her small team around the islands. At the end of the episode, you're going to meet Andy Ross, who is a weaver living on the island of Yell in Shetland. And Andy has a program where student weavers can come and stay at his centre, which is Global Yell, and either learn to weave or better their weaving skills. So Andy talks a bit about that, but he also talks about the history of Shetland tweed, because a lot of people have heard of Harris tweed but there's also Shetland tweed. Yep. Our guest on Knitters of the World is lovely Tori from Norway who also has some gorgeous feral designs. Our daughter Madeline will be joining us to give us a brief update from her travels in Australia. Andrea has a tutorial on combining brioche with double knitting which is really good and you'll get to see my latest completed pair of socks. Yay, Yay. that's for me. <laughs> um, but we're going to start with Andrea in under construction. As you can see, my Osmos kofta by Sisel Huyevik is nearly finished. Oh, good. <laughs> it's very exciting. I've spoken a lot about this design in the last three episodes, so I'm not going to say much today about it. But for new viewers, here is a picture of the original cardigan. I've changed it to become a cropped sort of jacket for me. And I'm knitting it at a completely different gauge to the original, which meant that I need to rework all of the maths and calculations. And I've done that, and I am really excited to say that it's worked. That is truly incredible. It is, for me. <laughs> so as you can see, my sleeve fits into my set-in sleeve very well. <laughs> that's, that's incredible, too. Your arm works, though. My arm works. Right. I can move it around. So that's the tricky bit when you re changing a pattern and doing the math. So that's been sewn in. I'm very pleased it's going to work. So this garment is steaked down the front and steaked at the armholes and I added a steak at the neck opening here and I reinforced the steaks with a sewing machine which was a new technique that I hadn't done before and I made a short uh, footage of that showing you how, how I did it in the previous episode, episode 41. And so all of the sticks have been reinforced. I've cut them all open so I could try the garment on to check that it was actually heading in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> and I will f do the finishing on the sticks right at the end. So that means I'll cut them down to two stitches width and then turn them underneath and sew them back. But I'll wait till everything else is finished first. You can see that my second uh, sleeve is nearly completed. So I did that in the round from the bottom up to the armholes and then I've been knitting back and forward on the cap. So purling and knitting the stranded section just for the, t for the cap. Um, so that's only got a little bit to go and then I'll be able to sew it in on this side. And also there was some debate as to whether I would sew up the li lining or not. In the original design, Sissel lets her lining curl up on the sleeves like this. I've decided to sew it up, so I've sewn it up already on, on the cuff. And there was also lining down here, so I've sewn that up, you can see it there. But I haven't sewn up the edges because when I finish the steaks and fold them back, they will tuck underneath the lining and it'll be a really nice, neat finish. That looks very neat, Dulce. It does. It's, well done. It's a really good, well, well done to Sissel <laughs> <laughs> for her design. So what else did I want to say? Uh, okay, so after the sleeve goes in, I then have to do the neck band and pick up the stitches for the button bands. And I've been toying with the idea of actually knitting a flat collar. So to make the jacket look more like a fitted jacket, fit, fitted crop jacket, and less like a cardigan. So I'm going to play around with that and see if I can make something that doesn't look completely ridiculous. <laughs> and Because I need to decide on what I do with the collar first before I, I pick up stitches and do the, the button band. So hopefully, next episode, I'll be sitting on the couch wearing my completely finished and blocked cropped jacket. Bravo. Yeah. 
Bring and Brag is the segment when we show off our finished projects. It doesn't actually feature very often because we both do only large projects. You've just seen Andrea's jacket. When you knit at the speed that I do, a pair of socks is also a large project. But Andrea, I have finished my latest pair of socks for you. Thank you. And they are beautiful. They are very beautiful. Yeah. Um, Very quickly, this is the um, Blackie Yarns Mohair Blend Sock Yarn. It's Mohair and Manx. I think it's a really beautiful yarn. Um, And the construction is two by two rib on the leg and at the top of the foot and a heel flap and gusset. And it's all nice and tightly knitted. So it makes it nice and snug and warm, just like you like it. And they're green. They're green. They're perfect. I love them very much. Andrew does just the best socks for me. And I am so appreciative. I don't like fancy socks, just a good, practical, warm sock. And I think this yarn is now going to be my go-to sock yarn for you to knit me socks. Yeah, I've finally (laughs) found the way to her heart. We're going to go back to under construction now with Andrew. He's going to show us that or give us an update on his progress on the Brioche and Double Knitting Project, Paris' Scarf. Paris' Scarf by, by Nancy Marchand. Yeah. Yes. In the last episode, we did show how we had managed to blow up the chart for this pattern. This is it. It's nice and big. Um, I've been working with this chart on my knees and also a little key to explain what the symbols mean to decipher the symbols. Um, and that's a little bit tricky because they mean one thing when you're heading in one direction and a different thing when they're heading in the other direction. So I would have occasional pauses or regular pauses to think, what does this symbol mean now? And uh, Andrea would offer her usual very helpful advice of read your knitting and it will tell you what to do next. Um, I was trying to read my knitting, but it wasn't telling me anything. (laughs) And so Andrea figured... She needs to do a little tutorial just for me. Yes. And that's what you've done. Yes, because I thought Andrew was staring at his chart for longer periods than he was actually knitting, yeah. so I thought something has to I be done here. that's a bit harsh, but... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the interesting thing about double knitting and brioche is that they have a lot in common and they can be combined really well. One of the things they have in common is that every second stitch you slip But with uh, brioche, you wrap these slip stitches and with double knitting, you don't. And uh, Nancy only uses a very simple form of of, um, double knitting in this project. Yes, Uh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Andrew was coming to a complete standstill every time he had to change the techniques because he wasn't sure. What do I do with my yarn? Is it meant to be at the front? Is it meant to be at the back? Do I wrap it this way? Do I wrap it that way? And so I thought I need to teach him to understand how the the fabric is made and these two techniques, and then he'll be able to read his um, knitting, knitting a bit better. better. Yeah. So I made this tutorial, and then we sat down on the couch, and I thought you did better. Yeah, I did do better. It did. It does. I mean, there's some basic ideas in there, and it helps a lot. I still have to slow down occasionally. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I thought even if you guys are not doing a double knitting or brioche project at the moment, that you might find the tutorial interesting to see how the two techniques work together. It's only short. So here it is. It's coming up now. And after that, you're going to meet the lovely Turi from Norway. This is Andrew's project. He's knitting Paris's scarf by Nancy Marchant and it uses a combination of brioche and double knitting. So the sections that look like a stripy rib are the brioche and the single colour stockingette sections are the double knitting. If I turn the work over, you can see it's in reverse. So the double knitting sections are now blue. So in both brioche knitting and double knitting, it takes two passes to complete a single row of knitting, since only half the stitches are knitted each time. So first of all, I would knit all the yellow stitches with the yellow yarn, and then I'd go back to the beginning of the row and knit all the blue stitches with the blue yarn. So both brioche and double knitting produce two layers of fabric. The two layers in the brioche are completely connected, but the two layers of the double knitting sections are separated in the middle, and you can see this on the side. So here's a brioche section, and you can see I can't pull it apart. It's completely connected and intertwined. And here's a double knitting section, and you can separate it into two layers of fabric with the pearl sides facing each other. So I'm going to show you how to work both these techniques and you'll see how the double knitting layers are separated and the brioche layers are really entwined together. 
And by the way, there are techniques showing you how to work both colours at the same time so that you're only doing one pass for a single row. But for a beginner, that's too confusing and it's also harder to get your knitting even. Because to do this, you'll have one colour in each hand, just like stranded knitting. But unlike stranded knitting, you're going to combine knit and purl stitches. So quite often one hand will work looser than the other hand especially on the purl stitches and that's why it's harder to get the fabric looking even. So now I'm going to show you how I work a couple of passes, so two passes is one row, combining the brioche and double knitting. I'll start with my yellow yarn and you can see that on this side all of the yellow columns are knit stitches. So I'll be doing brioche knit here in this section and slipping and wrapping all of the blue stitches which kind of look like pearl stitches in a one by one rib. They've receded into the background. And then when I come to the double knitting section, I'll be knitting all of the yellow stitches and slipping all the blue stitches. But when I slip the blue stitches, I make sure that my yellow yarn is carried in between the two layers so that you won't see it on the other side. So I knit my first stitch, I bring the yarn forward, I slip purlwise and yarn over and brioche knit. Slip forward, yarn over, that's going to be the yarn over, and brioche knit. So you can see that I've knitted all of the yellow columns. I slip my marker and now I'm up to the double knitting. So I have to knit the first stitch. And now I need to slip the blue stitch, but I have to bring my yarn to the front and then I slip it and then I use my yarn to the back. So that way you can see that little float is going to be on the inside of the fabric and it won't show on the outside. And then I knit yarn to the front, slip purlwise, so I'm slipping the blue stitch and you can see that float is on the inside of the two layers. So now I'm up to my second pass using the blue yarn and I'll be working all of the blue stitches. So in the brioche section I will brioche purl the blue stitches and they kind of look like purl stitches in a one by one rib, they're the ones that are receding and the ones that are at the front are the columns of yellow stitches. So I will simply slip and wrap them and brioche purl all the blue ones. When I come to the double knitting section, I will purl the blue stitches and I will slip the yellow stitches, making sure that my blue yarn travels in between the two fabrics so it doesn't show on the other side. The reason why I will purl the blue stitches is because the purl side of the blue fabric is facing me. If I separate this here, you can see that the purl side is facing me. My first stitch is yellow, so I don't work it, I just slip it purlwise. And now I'm going to brioche purl, and then I need to slip the yellow stitch and wrap it. Brioche purl, slip the yellow stitch and wrap it, brioche purl, and now I'm up to the double knitting. So I'm going to put my yarn to the back and slip the yellow stitch. I put my yarn to the back because I don't want a float coming across it. And then I bring it to the front and I purl the blue stitch, yarn to the back and slip the yellow stitch, yarn forward and purl. If I, if I didn't put my yarn to the back, I would have a float going across the knit stitch. So we don't want that. So that therefore I put the yarn to the back, slip. So I hope that gives you a better idea of the technique of brioche and double knitting, how similar they are and how well they work together in a single pattern. <music>
I have been knitting since I was around five years old and I've always made uh, up my own things. When the Ravelry came, I uh, was able to uh, start publishing my patterns. At first I only made hats and mittens and things, uh, easy things like that. But then in uh, 2012 I went to Shetland Woolwick for the first time and I took a class in uh, pattern writing with Jen Arnold Culliford. She made it uh, understandable and um, I decided to try and make my first garment. And that's uh, the vest I'm wearing now. It's called uh, Blomekrans which means a uh, wreath of flowers. And uh, with this, I broke one of the rules she tried to teach us. For your first garment, you should make small pattern repeats. That will make life easier for you. But uh, I managed to, uh, to put the decreases and the increases uh, between the flowers. So um, it finally worked out. Uh, later, I uh, took on the challenge to add sleeves to my garments and I want to show you some of my sweater design. This uh, sweater is called Next Year in Lyric and it's by far my most popular pattern. I was inspired at Shetland Woolwick uh, in 2012 by all the fair isle motifs and uh, I wanted to go back the next year but I couldn't so I instead I made this sweater and call it Next Year in Lyric. I've used um, different uh, fair isle motifs and you might notice that the central motifs are more uh, filled than, uh, than these on the sides which, which are more kind of airy and open motifs. I've turned this uh, also into a, a cardigan totally different colors. So the next sweater I want to show you is this, uh, the one I'm wearing now, which is called the uh, town, meaning uh, garden in Dutch. This sweater is uh, inspired by a, an embroidery I found on, um, on Pinterest. It's an old embroidery from Slovakia from the 18th century, I believe. This uh, sweater I um, submitted to uh, Twist Collective and I was very pleased to have it published there winter 2013, if I'm not mistaken. This one is also worked from the top down. You start with a turtleneck, add some short rows in the back and uh, then all the increases for the yoke are incorporated into the stranded colorwork pattern. I, uh, as for the last sweater, I also made a cardigan from this one. This is made in a Norwegian yarn called Rauma Tretrald Strikkegarn, which is a very um, sturdy yarn that will last, uh, last forever. I like these uh, flowers so much that I've also used them in a toddler sweater. Here I've played with uh, leftover wool from different projects. This is the Sjölingsta kofta, meaning cardigan from Sjölingsta, which is a museum a spinning mill in the southernmost part of Norway. The museum organizes knitting days every year and um, that was when I was inspired to make this uh, cardigan. It's um, the roses and the, and the birds are inspired by the beautiful blankets they weave at the museum and the oak leaves uh, are inspired by the, the forest. You might have seen that I make a lot of mittens. And uh, together with the uh, knitting friends that I met uh, through Ravelry, through blogs, we have made a couple of years ago this uh, mitten book. It's uh, called Eventyrvotti, which means uh, fairy tale mittens. So all these mittens are inspired by different fairy tales. So you can see some of them here. We had uh, lots of fun making this book. This is my uh, fairy tale cardigan. It's inspired by uh, a pair of mittens that I made 
with flowers all over and I like the flowers so much that I wanted to use them uh, for something else. So I came up with this cardigan using the Kevney yarn. I um, put the flowers on top of the yoke and here in the bottom. This garter stitch button band is worked together with the, with the cardigan in the round and then it's cut open and folded with a crochet edging here and I also used the crochet to make buttonholes and edgings here. Here's a new sweater that I've just published. It's called the Saco Otavalo. Saco is a Spanish word meaning uh, uh, jumper in uh, Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian Spanish and Otavalo is a, an Ecuadorian town where they have this uh, fantastic crafts market and the sweater is uh, inspired by the patterns and the colors uh, that I've, I uh, saw in that market. You can see an example in this gorgeous bag. Thanks for having me on the show, Andrea and Andrew. It's such a pleasure watching your uh, video podcast. I hope you continue for a long time. Happy knitting, everyone. Bye. is really lovely. I've been following Turi for a couple of years now so it was really great to meet her at Shetland during the Wool Week. She was there doing some classes and Turi is also an admirer of Marie Wallen's designs and the three of us were all together on the Tuesday evening when Marie was launching her latest book so I thought it was really special to be able to include them in the same episode. I've got uh, the book of mittens that Turi was showing you in during her segment here. It's a really beautiful hardback book. Um, it is all in Norwegian, but uh, mittens are often in or made in standard constructions and they have standard um, sizes and standard stitch counts, a little bit like socks. So if you've done knit mittens before, I think that you could use this book. It's got absolutely stunning, very clear, well-written charts. And I think you could just read the charts and um, apply them to your standard uh, construction. Pattern, yeah. yeah, and and you could end up having the same amount, the same designs, basically without having to read the Norwegian. It is just a beautiful book, and yeah, very well written. Yep. Um, Tori has offered our patrons a twenty five percent discount on her pattern for the Blomakrantz sticked vest. It was actually the very first garment that we saw in her segment just now. Yeah, this is a perfect first sticking project. The front neck, the back neck and the sleeve openings are steaked, so there's no stranding in pearl. And for those of you who don't like sleeves, this is a really nice quick project because there's no sleeves. The pattern, I've got the pattern and it's really clear and well written. It's got beautiful charts all in colour so it's very easy to read. Turi is offering this discount until New Year's Eve. So it's a really perfect um, garment to try out, sticking in, in our, if you want to join our Carl as well, which is running to the end of January. The recommended yarn for this project is Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight. And the Woolly Thistle has given our patrons a discount on this yarn and for the last couple of weeks. And she is actually going to extend her discount on this yarn for another week. So if you're a patron and you would like to knit this pattern in the recommended yarn, you will now get a discount on the pattern and a discount on the yarn. So that's pretty great, especially because it's happening right now during our um, fruity steaked garment carl. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we're coming up now to our interview with Marie Wallen. It's a fun and chatty interview. Marie will show us her designs in this beautiful collection and there's some Ferrar designs here for first time Ferrar knitters as well as some for advanced Ferrar knitters. I've got I've bought the yarn for two of these designs so hopefully you'll see one of them on my needles very soon and the recommended yarn is the Spindrift which is 100% Shetland uh, wool from Jamieson's of Shetland. Yep. So enjoy the interview and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. Today I'm in Lerick, Shetland, and I'm here with Marie Wallen. Marie has come to the Shetland Wool Week to launch her latest collection of beautiful Fair Isle garments and accessories, and her book is called Shetland. So last night she had the opening launch, and I picked up my copy, and I'm really excited. There's so many things in here that I really want to knit. So That's today, good to hear. yeah. <laughs> so today Marie is going to go through the garments and the accessories that are in this book and um, tell us a little bit about the skill level that's required because there's something here for everybody. There's something that you, an absolute beginner could knit as well as somebody who is a very a veteran feral knitter. So I thought we might just start off with you telling us a bit about why you chose Shetland as your inspiration for this collection. Okay, well it started a few years ago whilst I was still under contract with, with Rowan um, and at the time, obviously, because I was under contract with them, I was um, only allowed to use their own, their yarn for my own collection. So in March last year, I came out of contract with them and I was allowed, therefore I was free to use other people's yarns. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, but prior to that, I was always wanted to do a Shetland collection yeah. because I love Shetland wool yarns because in my previous job before I was a hand knit designer I was a machine knit designer and we used a fair bit of Shetland wool um, over over the years obviously for machine and I've always loved its you know its character its authenticity if you like um, and the colours range that you can get in Shetland but obviously when I came out of contract I knew what I wanted to use but which Shetland hand knit yarn did I want to use so I sought the advice of a friend who is a lady called Bridget Kelly, who um, is one of the directors of the Campaign for All, and she advised me to approach Jamesons of Shetland, primarily because um, not only do they produce a four-ply yarn called Spindrift, um, which is obviously made from Shetland wool grown on the islands, um, but they also produce the whole yarn on the island too. So all the processes from the cleaning, the scouring, the carding, everything, the spinning, boiling, it's all done at the mill at, at Sanes, um, which is in the north of, of Shetland. And um, so this I thought, well, that's important to me. So if I was going to do a collection supporting Shetland, well, then I had to be a yarn that was produced entirely on the island and not produced elsewhere. Um, and then obviously when I saw the colour range of their Spindrift yarn, um, I just thought, oh my God, this is just like a designer's dream because mm. they're the, like over 100 and odd, 60 odd colours. So um, so it was an amazing colour palette. And then over the next few months, I, we discussed the plans for the collection. And, um, and then in May this year, I came up and did the photography shoot. And Elaine... Uh, very kindly loaned um, Belmont House on Unst for us to use as a base, uh, which is absolutely beautiful Georgian house, which has been restored um, 
to its former glory and you you can hire it to stay there and it's just absolutely stunning. So tell us a little bit about a photo shoot. What does that entail? Is it a week-long thing? Well, we were here for the best part of a week and um, we travelled on a Saturday. I can't remember the exact date, but... um, and how, sorry, how many people involved? Oh, there's just a team of four. Okay, so there's, yeah. there's myself who acts as obviously designer and art director. Then there's Peter, um, Peter Christian, who's uh, my photographer. And then obviously Georgia, who's the love, my the beautiful model. model. And then Francis, who uh, is my uh, hair and makeup artist. And these three people I, I knew from my Rowan days, basically. I first met them all on various shoots on Rowan and and over the years we've become really quite firm friends but we're scattered all over now because Georgia has just moved to Vancouver in Canada oh really yes (laughs) (laughs) so but she's promised to come back to uh, carry on because I obviously still want to carry on using her as a model because I I just think as my brand grows that I'd like you know still use Georgia Mm -hmm. and as she changes Mm -hmm. and as she matures and Mm -hmm. stuff I think it'd be a really nice Story, yeah, really, well, she's a very um, naturally she's a very beautiful woman, but mm. she's also got the the facial features and the hair that really tones in with the the oh, feral colours. Yeah. yeah, absolutely perfect model for my type of yeah. design work. Really, so yeah. that's yeah. great. So, is there any funny stories that you can tell us? Because I saw in one of the photos that there's uh, there's some fantastic Shetland ponies coming up around Well, here. that, um, yeah, I mean, that wasn't organised. That just happened on cue. But as we were travelling around, I spotted this rusting sort of bothy um, in a, a, on a hill on a field and said to Peter, it's going to be perfect to shoot mm-hmm. some, uh, some of the Shetland collection there. He agreed. And so when we, it was on the Wednesday when we, we shot the particular shots, there when we were just literally arrived and climbed over the wall to walk up to the buffet these three Shetland ponies appeared just around the corner and they just were very friendly and very nosy wanted to come down and have a look what we were doing yeah um one got a bit friendly with with Georgia (laughs) and her clothes clothes. started to eat you know started to have a nibble of a kilt that she was wearing (laughs) Um, but they were they were really nice. Yeah. Um, but yes, they're a little bit went... like um, smudgy dogs, aren't they? Yeah. They like to come up and yeah, get yeah, a yeah. scratch. Yeah, and... yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah, and I think they were after food, to be honest. Yeah. But while we're still talking about photo shoots, I'm always so impressed with the accompanying um, skirts and and accessories that you put with your garments. Mm. So tell us a little bit about that. Is that something that you personally choose and go out and plan? To well, go? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean. Um, so all my all my design work tends to be fair olive or, or twisted stitch and cables, but I the types of yarns that I use they go so well with checks and and tweeds and and kilts. So at home, my own wardrobe I have a collection of of lovely tweed skirts and and some vintage um, checks and kilts and things, which some of them you can see in in the Shetland book. Um, and and some people notice that I, I do use the same skirts over you know over and over again. That's because they go so perfectly mm. with with the with the designs. But I also asked another friend who happens to be um, a shepherdess up in Cumbria. Um, her name is Alison O'Neill, and um, not only is she a busy working shepherdess with a herd of rough fell sheep. Um, she has her own small collection of tweed clothing and a small bag range, which she's slowly growing. And um, and uh, I asked her, you know, has she got any any skirts that she could loan to me to to style? And she was more than happy to oblige. So I sent her um, how I did it was I I sent her my design swatches for each of the designs, and then she just she looked at the collection that she had, and then just put skirts with with each of the designs, and then sent them to me so I've, I've used you know what I could yeah and I know her work and it's really stylish yeah and beautiful yeah. and timeless yeah yeah which goes with your yeah. designs as well Absolutely. so that's great so let's get on to the designs would you like to show start off by showing us some of the easier um feral garments yeah. or accessories the um probably the easiest design in the book is probably this one which is called Muckle Row um it's a, an um it's a very simple two color um, for our border uh, which just goes into a stocking stitch it's a yoke and you, you can see the fashioning marks 
here up on, on the yoke and it's entirely knitted in the round. So for the beginner fur Ella who's not really has not tackled a sweater before, this is probably a good one to do. It's a no it's not a fitted sweater, it's an oversized sweater, so it's meant to be worn loose. Um but apart from that it's relatively simple to do. But then the I have done another um two colour um sweater here, which is not knitted in the round but it's knitted flat um again it's two color um i mean i've used two very close um tonal colors here you could make it different by making it more contrasting if you wanted to um but i've added the farrow with moss stitch which gives a nice textured effect um and again it's an oversized very easy to wear sweater throw it on over yeah. pair of jeans so it has a moss stitch um, so moss stitch welt border at the at the bottom yeah moss stitch yoke at the top and on, on the sleeves as well yeah so if you wanted the sleeves slightly smaller you could you know do less moss stitch there so yeah. it's not a it's not a problem so it's very easy to adapt yes yeah, so so. it's very easy to adapt yeah. it to your yeah yeah so out of the accessories, the easiest is probably a fetless scarf, which is also featured in this year's Shetland World Week annual. Um, it's a very simple fur owl design from the point of view that it uses very simple repeating small fur owl um, motifs, if you like. So you've got tiny little squares, you've got the zigzag, um, but they're all made different on different colour bands. Um, but it's a, also a great design to use all those little ends that you've got left over from a sweater or something like that. So as a as a stash buster, really. It is, um, isn't it? Yeah. So you could have fun changing the colours and you know ha you know having having a good old play with it, really, and producing something and unique what, yeah. to you. And what I noticed, sorry to interrupt, but I noticed that there's not um, any patterns that will have long floats. No, no, really. it's, again, so, it's very simple to do. The fact that the very small motif, yeah. so you can get the repeat really easily. Yeah. Um, and it's obviously entirely knitted in the round. And if you didn't want to make the long scarf, you can make it into a cowl you could, as well. Yeah. yeah. So... That's lovely. Actually, it goes very well with this jumper. It does. This jumper that I'm wearing, by the way, is from um, Springtime, which is an earlier collection of Marie's. Yeah. This is the daffodil. Yes, yeah. right. <laughs> I love that colour. It looks fabulous. Yeah. This, yeah, this is uh, the little grey sheep. Yes. Yeah. Staying on the accessories, we've got another simpler one, which is probably once you've tackled something like that, I'd move on to something like this, which again is knitted in the round, but the fur owl itself is a bit more complicated. From the point of view, the fact that the motifs are bigger and the repeats are bigger, so therefore it's harder to, um, con you've got to concentrate more when you're actually knitting them. But, you know, it's still only two colours in a row. Yeah. I mean, I do say to a lot of people, my work does look a lot more complicated than what it actually is because mm. I only ever use two colours in a row. Yes. So I think I think it's great because you could start, I think you could start with either one yeah. of these as a beginning feral project mm. and when you've knitted it all up, it looks so beautiful that people are going to think you're an expert feral Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter if you go wrong, if you accidentally put the wrong colour in the wrong place. It yeah. doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. that's the beauty about hand knitting. You make it unique to you and yeah. those little mistakes just make it all the bits more special. Yeah. And then we've got um, a little tam, which is um, named after Scalawa, um, which is the old capital of Shetland. Um, and it's where I stayed when I first came to um, uh, Shetland, which is why I wanted to name one of the designs after yeah. after the town. But again, another simple one, it's knitted in the round. Again, it looks more complicated than what it is, but I think easily mm. achievable by the, you know, a mm. person that's not got much experience yeah. of knitting fur owl. And this yarn is woolen spun, isn't it? Um, it is. It's just a lovely, it's just so nice to yeah. knit fur owl with. Yeah. Um, one of the first projects I did use, using it was uh, a design called Fur Owl Patch Cushion. Um, and when I was knitting that, I just knew it was the perfect yarn for yeah. this collection. And it's just a dream to knit with, to knit fur owl with, because it's got that extra stickiness, if yes. you like, yeah. and it makes stranding so much easier. Yeah, all the little hooks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, okay. yeah. And then another simple project are the, are the mittens, which are called Scary's Mittens. Um, and there's instructions in the book um, for, for knitting them both in the round and flat. And then 
once you've tackled one of the accessories, then go on to do one, of the, one of the other garments. Or if you're a garment knitter, just get straight into the garments. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. The next garment is um, Ninian, which is um, a little bit more complicated than the, the designs that we've just shown you. Again, it's, it's a banded um, ferrule design with small motifs. So again, once you actually analyse it, it's not that difficult. Now, it is knitted flat. I've designed it knitted flat, but there's no real reason why you couldn't convert it to be knitted in the round up to the armholes. Because it's set in, unless you're a very experienced ferrule knitter and are very experienced at steaking, I wouldn't suggest that you would steak a, a set in armhole because they are quite complicated um, to work out yeah. um, so therefore I would advise just to knit in the round up to the up to the um, to the shaping of the armholes and the neck and then you could you could steep the front yeah you could also do the armholes in the round yeah to here up to and the then shaping. just do the cap yeah back absolutely and forth. yeah I also when I I do a collection I always try and do a couple of cardigans in a collection to balance it out um, but I, I, whenever I do a couple of cardigans, it's always nice to do a longer length one, which is pockets, because I love pockets. Uh, all my dresses and skirts have always got to have pockets in them. And I love this detail down here, the checkered detail. Mm, it just makes it a little bit it's more great. different. Is that um, combination in Tarsia? No, no, you've it's done all fair yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's and it's named after Saint Nin, Ninian's Isle, which is um, in the south of the island. And if you ever get a chance to come to Shetland. It's in one of the must-see places. Yeah. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful um, spit of beach with the sea coming in on both sides okay. and a little island at, at the end of it. It's just absolutely stunning. Sounds great, yeah. And then we've next got um, this, another card, the, the second cardigan, which is called Unst, um, named after the island where we stayed. Um, again, this is one of... A personal favourite of mine out of the collection. I just, it's a very much a classic, um, what I my eyes a very classic Farrell cardigan. Um, it's got the traditional sort of vertical ribs. It looks a lot more complicated than what it is, but again, when you analyse it, it's small repeating um, motifs. It's just like changes colour a lot. And again, this is another one which possibly could be knitted in the round up to the armholes. You could steep the front. Yeah. And I really love the way you've done the organised the colours here because that's quite a different colour scheme than that. Yeah. And you've got them yeah. all balancing yeah, out. Yeah, but it all balances yeah, well. Yeah, they're beautiful. Do you have any particular shades out of this yarn that you really love and have to be in, in each to be honest, no, they're all equally lovely. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. all, I mean, a lot of my design work and a lot of fur I'll work is, I suppose it's, it's, di it's different to a lot of people. I don't use very much contrasting colours. Mm -hmm. I use very similar tonal mm -hmm. colours. Um, so that's why a lot of my work looks more muted, more mm. um, blended, if you, if you like. Yeah. And they're feathery yarns, yeah. aren't they? They're yeah. feathered. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, if these do. were a solid dyed yarn, it, the effect would be a lot more it would harsher. Be, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Slightly gaudy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so this is um, Bresse, which again is another favourite of mine. I've already worn it a few times. Um, it's a, another sort of fairly simple one from the point of view it's knitted entirely in the, in the round. It's got a deeper farewell yoke. It, again, it looks quite complicated, um, but it's small repeating motifs. Um, but changes colour a lot, basically. But it's fitted, so it's a nice fitted um, sweater, and it's just so nice to wear, to be honest. And then we've got um, Musa, which is, um, again, an all-over furral. Um, here it's slightly different, the fact I've used a slightly more contrasting base, so the bands, so it appears more of a banded, um, fur aisle, whereas some of my other fur aisles which are banded or have backgrounds which are all muted so it all blends in one to the other. Okay, yes. And um, so therefore you can see the difference when you do do use a stronger colour that it yeah. really pops the, the bands out. Um, but this is a great layer piece if you like. It's um, it's oversized, it's got these lovely side vents um, and it's just a great piece to throw over a pair of jeans, you know, with a... a you know, whatever top you want to wear underneath it, basically. So that's Musa. Now we come to my favourite, I think. Right. <laughs> so, which, which is probably the most challenging one out of 
of the collection, um, basically because it's um, it's more of an all over Farrell design. Um, it's still only two colours in a row. It uses a lot of colours, but you're going to have to concentrate. Basically, it's not one to knit in front of the TV. Um, so you're going to have to sort of concentrate following the chart because of the bigger. It has got a pattern repeat, but it's a quite a big pattern repeat to it. And again, it's a fitted sweater. I've made the welt slightly longer, um, and instead of having a plain colour welt, make it more interesting by yeah. by striping it. I think this is a really great detail, and it also because it's rib and it's so mm. high, it does do this natural fitting yes, yes. without having to do any yeah. shaping. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's it's very much a basic shape, really. There's no shaping in, yeah, in the body, a, and it's a, a drop shoulder. Yeah, um, but when worn, it's you know it, it just, looks fitted. It, it looks fitted. Yeah. yeah. And then finally, we come on to Yale, um, which is um, a lovely boxy um, cardigan stroke jacket, um, which has no back neck shaping. So if, if we just show you, uh, you can see there's no yeah. back neck shaping. Yeah. So the shoulders meet at the centre back neck. And what that, what that causes is when it's worn, it causes the fronts to ride up. So it gives you that really nice asymmetric yeah. sort of um, shape, which looks really nice over a long dress or, you know, a long skirt. Yeah. Um, and it's very, very flattering it's for all sizes. Yeah. yeah. It's very flattering for all sizes to wear, really. Yeah. And you can put a beautiful a pin, pin like, like I've this. got there. Yeah. yeah. But again, this is quite a simple one to do, um, but it is steeped. Um, so you're going to have to learn how to steep if you Steeping don't know. Is no problem. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a little feature at the back of the book that yeah. tells you how to If how you to use steep. the right wool, yes, then absolutely. steeping is so easy. Yeah, it is. You it's just, just having the confidence and, yeah. to cut something yeah. that you've, you've knitted, basically. Um, but again, this is one of the more simpler what designs out the book from the, pack, from the point of view. It's simple, um, small repeating motifs and then you've got a long long section here which again is is quite simple it's a simple all over two color and then do you pick you pick up the stitches yeah, after along the, the steaking edge the yeah steak and yeah. you do this lovely band yeah and then you've got a little bit of is this moss it's stitch? moss stitch yeah. edge yeah and, and then the side. um the armholes are steeped and then the sleeves are, are yeah. knitted downwards in the round and what i really like about this is that there is shaping on the shoulders yeah. So that doesn't make it like those 80s boxes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's important. Yeah. To, in fact, I always shape them quite deeply. Yeah. Um, it just gives that better fit. It does. And yeah. then you, that's what I realised here. Yeah. Then you don't, it doesn't look yeah. like a drop shoulder. Yeah. And also, you make your armholes narrower mm. as well. Because mm. uh, I think if you make your armholes deeper, obviously, your top of your sleeves wider. And then when it's worn, it looks a bit from. Yeah, you get all of these. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> rolls. And yeah, which is not very flattering. Well, thank you so much for showing us these gorgeous garments. I want to go and try them all on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been my pleasure yeah, to show them to you. Yeah, it's been a f fantastic to have you here with us and, and to see them in person and to hear you talk about the inspiration behind. And being in Shetland, you can just see it is such a gorgeous place. It's so worth coming for a visit. Yeah. And it's so much fun looking through the book and recognizing places that we had just been visiting and you know and saying oh that's this garment's yeah, yeah, yeah. named after that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. which is the intention I, yeah. I wanted really so um Good. so all the places i couldn't photograph it would be in the next in the next next one which great yes i'm still planning to do one good another collection using jameson's uh spindrift probably not next year it'll be the year okay. after so maybe you might have a male garment Maybe, in there. I know. But I, I, keep getting asked to, <laughs> I keep getting asked to do some designs for menswear. And I will do, because interestingly enough, before I joined Rowan, I was, that was, yes. I did, I was a menswear designer. Yeah. I was, I did mainly menswear and children's So we're work. waiting for it, because there's a whole lot of knitters out there who've got enough garments for themselves. Yeah. And their husbands are all saying, knit me Well, one. I was just about <laughs> to say that if I did do a collection in menswear, and I've got no excuse now for my husband, we've been married nearly 23 years and I've never knitted him a jumper. That is so <laughs> shameful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you committed yourself yeah <laughs> okay well thanks so much again marie it okay. was lovely to have you on the podcast okay so we'll say goodbye bye bye, bye.
while I was editing Marie Wallen's interview and then afterwards editing Andy Ross's interview who is the weaver from Global Yell and you're going to see his interview in just a minute, I got a strong desire to start sewing up my Shetland tweed fabric that I bought while I was in Shetland. So I am an inexperienced sewer. Um, I spent a long time trying to find a skirt pattern that would really inspire me, but I didn't find one. But earlier this year, I did sew this tweed skirt, which I wear a lot and I, I like a lot, except for it does have a tendency to hang a little bit stiffly. So this weekend, or last weekend, I met Isabel Kramer. And you, many of you will already know her. She's a really great German um, knitwear designer, but she's also a trained seamstress. And she told me that if I uh, cut the fabric in, this, in the bottom half on the bias, it would hang in a softer flow. So for those of you who are also novice sewers, I thought I'd just tell you that the warp threads are the threads that go from the top to the bottom. They're normally um, woven under tension, so they're very strong. And then you've got uh, weft, weft threads that yeah. go from the right to the left or the left to the right. And the fabric doesn't have a lot of stretch in it. Lengthwise, you can see that, or widthwise. But if you put it diagonally, which is the bias, it has a surprising amount of stretch. You can see it better perhaps on this long strip, which I cut. Um, it's a, a piece that's cut on the bias and you can see if I stretch it that's a lot of stretch that's just like a knit fabric almost yeah and you can see it gets narrower it does yeah it does okay so here is my beautiful Shetland tweed skirt and I did cut the fabric on the bias. Now I know that you have, a, you have to be a very experienced sewer to be able to match up all of the checks and the plaids on all of the seams. And I, I thought from the beginning, I'm gonna have a tough time doing that. I'm not experienced enough. So I thought I'll just do my best and I'll live with the results. I did try to employ Andrew's brain to help me figure yeah, out. You're hopeful there, <laughs> I think. How to match the side seams and the back seams. Yeah, I think part of the trickiness here is that it's actually got three panels. Mm. I think if you had an even number of panels, it would be easier. Possibly. Anyway, he told me that it would only work on certain sizes. So that gave me the excuse and the confidence to go ahead and not worry about it if I made a mess. Yeah. So, but actually I was quite surprised with my results. I don't understand them, but quite surprised. So I thought I will show you Okay, so on this side seam, you might notice that the blue stripes match up perfectly at the bottom of the skirt, but as you get higher up, they become uneven. So that's a bit of a mystery. <laughs> on the other side of the skirt, the blue stripes don't match up at all, but the orange stripes match up perfectly all the way up. That's a really weird one. That's a real weird <laughs> mystery. The back seam, you'll see here. So the blue stripes are running horizontally across two panels with the seam in the middle. And you might notice that the blue stripes match up beautifully at the bottom of the skirt, but as we go higher, closer up to the zipper, they become uneven. So it's all of mystery to me. I'm really not uh, clever enough to fig figure that out just yet. I have lined the skirt there. It's not finished as you can see, raw edges. And then I put in my zip. When I put in my zip and I tried it on, I found my zipper was all wavy and bumpy. <clears throat> and it's the same design as this skirt and I didn't have that with this skirt. So I thought, oh dear, what have I done? So Andrew was trying to feel around everywhere, checking out, is this... <laughs> <laughs> Don't say too much about that. <laughs> okay. Is this fabric pulling too much? Is that fabric? We couldn't find a problem. So in my despair, I googled, why is my zipper going wavy and bumpy? And the answer seems to be that sometimes this happens with skirts cut on the bias, which fits my skirt. And the solution is meant to be, is that you take out the, the zipper, you hang up the fabric for a couple of days and let gravity do its business, and then you try again and very slowly put in the zipper. So I- it Sounds like you're hanging it out like a good steak, <laughs> a good piece of meat. You know? Yeah. yeah. To let it ripen. Yeah. Okay. 
So I did unpick the bottom part of the zipper up to this top section. This top section has got interfacing, it's very stable, it's not moving in any direction whatsoever and it's been hanging up for a couple of days. So hopefully I will put it back and it won't be lumpy bumpy anymore. I'll do the hem and with a bit of luck next episode I'll be sitting here wearing it. But if I don't get up and turn around and show you how well this zipper is fitting, you know it doesn't fit and it actually looks like a bit like a dog's breakfast. So <laughs> yeah. wish me luck. Coming up now is a quick update from our daughter Madeline who has flown the nest to visit Australia for around five months after which she will return. Yes, we hope. Um, we both have family in Australia so she's visiting them. Um, as some of you will know Madeline from earlier episodes, she has presented her very own knitting projects. You'll see one of them in this segment. Um, and she has also accompanied us on our extreme knitting expeditions and adventures. So we thought you might like to have a little look at what she's up to. Um, it's only short and shortly after that, we'll be meeting Andy Ross from Global Yell. I've been here in Australia for six weeks now and I've had so many new and exciting experiences. Um, the first two weeks I spent here in Sydney exploring the area and hanging out on the beach a lot. And I also got the pleasure to meet Tina, who's one of our patrons in person. And she generously took me out for lunch and coffee and then also showed me the wool shop that she works at called Skein Sisters. And it was a really cool wool shop and I had a great time with her. After that, I decided to fly up to Queensland to visit family on the Gold Coast, where I um, went hiking and camping with my aunt Michaela, um, whose mum's sister, in Lamington National Park. And it was absolutely beautiful. Um, Michaela has this really cool Land Rover where she took out the back seats and uh, turned it into a mini home that she can drive around everywhere. She um, has a mattress, she has a fridge and she has a whole lot of cupboards and uh, drawers that she can stock things in and it's super cool. And of course I have also been to Surface Paradise but I did not go surfing because the weather wasn't very good. However, I am starting surfing lessons tomorrow at Maroubra Beach back here in Sydney. So after Queensland, I came back here to Sydney and I've been living with Dad's younger sister and her family in Bronte. And it's been so cool living really close to the beach. And although I am living with family, it can get lonely, especially when I didn't have a job. Uh, I got quite bored at times. So I decided to do some coffee making lessons. Um, and because the coffee here in Australia is just really good. So since then I've been able to get two jobs as a waitress in two different cafes and I'm able to practice my barista skills on the side. Apart from that I've also been taking swimming lessons to up my freestyle and also I'm thinking of joining a swim club that trains in the ocean which is an experience that I certainly wouldn't be able to have in Germany. So I'm really happy to be here and I've been enjoying myself a lot. Thanks again to all of our valued patrons. We are independent and don't receive financial support from sponsorship or advertising. We rely totally on the generosity of our patrons to be able to continue producing this show, which is very much a full-time job. You can become a patron for around the cost of a couple of coffees per month, and this just all adds up and enables us to continue producing the show. So if you value our show and enjoy watching it, we do ask you to please become a patron. Thank you. Andy Ross is really passionate about weaving and in particular the history of tweed weaving in Shetland. Um, we were able to visit Andy when we were in Shetland. The second day we were there, we drove up, we took the car ferry, which is really fun, and we're able to meet him. So enjoy this interview. Yeah. We'll be back with you in another two weeks. Yes. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.
welcome. This is the Fruity Knitting Podcast and I'm in Shetland and today I'm on the island of Yell and I'm at the Global Yell which is a weaving centre and I'm sitting with Andy Ross who's the creative director of Global Yell. So you can stay and you can learn how to weave or develop your weaving skills at the Global Yell and we're going to learn more about that later in their Stay and Make program. But Andy has also done a lot of research into weaving in Shetland and in particular Shetland tweed. So you're going to tell us a bit about that, aren't you? I am. Thank you very much for coming all the way up to Yell. <laughs> uh, so we've just finished the first part of a tweed research project, which is looking at uh, where there was tweed produced in the islands and uh, what is left out there, because tweed in Shetland really only disappeared in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, which is relatively late. And then, of course, um, Jemison's on the west side started up and continued to produce tweeds to traditional patterns and colours. So our tweed research looked at um, where we could find collections, and to our surprise, we actually found quite a few. Uh, there's, of course, the ADES collection, which is in the archive store in Lerwick and in the museum. But we also found some down at Hosick, uh, which is on the mainland in the South Mainland. And Hosick has boxes and boxes of beautiful tweeds, and the patterns and the yarns that go into those tweeds. So when we were actually working on the tweed research project, there was a little team of us. We did interviews with people who were working in the industry, who told us something about the working conditions, which were apparently not great, but there was a lot of comradeship and fun to be had. Um, it was a hard life, I think, um, but it was an interesting one. I think people found it uh, a way to make money relatively easily, but as soon as, of course, the oil came to Shetland, then the tweed industry, which was already declining, just completely disappeared. So Shetland tweed we found uh, at Hosick. Um, when I opened the first box on uh, my very first visit to Hosick, and it was purely by chance that I knew there was a collection down there, uh, I was astonished to find that the tweeds had actually been put away completely in the oil. So we weave in the oil to keep the fibres under control. And the oil had protected the tweeds. So of course they smelt horrible. They were very musty because they'd been in storage for 30 years, something like that. And I pulled open the first box and neatly folded with the tweeds, but also the patterns that went with the tweeds and some of the yarns that went with those. Would you like to see some of those? Yes, definitely. So these are a couple of um, bundles of yarns that we found down at Hosick. Of course, nicely labelled, an 18-count pink mix. You can see this is quite a fine yarn. And then this lot here, which is lots of different weights of yarn, sorry. Uh, you can see, I guess this must come from somewhere around about the 1960s or 70s, judging by that orange in there. There's a very fine yarn, and then there's quite thick. So they were weaving with um, different counts of yarn, different weights of yarn, and we found a lot of this yarn still on the shade cards, um, which had come from the factories where they bought, and they bought the yarns in from south. Can you tell us quickly, why is um, Harris Tweed so well known and Shetland Tweed not as well known? Because Harris Tweed is protected by law. So there's a statute on the books um, mm. to protect Harris Tweed. It has to be made in a particular way in Harris. Um, and we never protected ours in the same kind of way. Uh, what we know about Shetland Tweed is that it was being produced for sale around the world at that point. Europe, um, we were exporting to Germany, to Brussels... We were exporting a lot to America. Uh, we were exporting to Japan in a small kind of way. And we were exporting a lot to Savile Row down in London. And previously, um, towards the beginning of the 20th century, Shetland tweed was known as the aristocrat of homespuns because it okay. was so fine. So the difference between Harris and Shetland is that uh, Shetland is much finer. Harris yeah. is much more hard-wearing and durable. Okay. Um, Shetland is not. You can see from this piece here that it's, it's a fine kind of fabric. In fact, if I held it up to a light, you'd be able to see through it a little. What we do think about um, Shetland, what I think about Shetland tweed, is that because we were using four-shaft looms, 
uh, the interest had got to come from the colour rather than the structure of the fabric okay. because the looms are very simple. So you can see the colours. There's a beautiful green and a blue in there. The red lines represent the different coloured uh, warps coming down and the different wefts going across in blocks. So everywhere you see a red line, that means that the warp colours have changed. And so you're weaving a different, a different cloth at that point. Okay. So I'll show you another piece. You can see the red line very clearly yes. in there, and you can also see some holes. And the holes are where those pieces have been cut out and either pasted into books or sent away to as different factories and, as swatches, yeah. exactly. So what Hosick has and what the archive, AD's archive has got, is a lot of these samples, and they give us a really good representation of weaving from the 1920s all the way through to 1970s. One of my favourites is this piece, which also comes from Hosek, and that is really bright. It is. Very, very. So I presume that this is from the 1970s. And interestingly, there is another piece almost identical in the 80s archive, just like this. So okay. at some point, someone must have ordered all of these very bright colours. It's interesting how here it's more pastely, and it's getting darker over there, isn't it? Let me tell you how to read a sample. Yes. So in a sample, you have different warp colours. The warps are the threads that go from the back of the loom to the front, and that's what you weave on. Different warp colours coming down, and then you're weaving the same weft colours across. Okay. So theoretically, that would mean that your diagonals are going to be perfect because they're the same colours, warp and weft. And there are also going to be blocks of solid colour appearing in those diagonals, and you can see that there are blocks of solid colour blocks of solid colour, yes. and so on. Yeah. So in this like sample, it. which is 5 by 5, you have 25 different blocks of colour, and you know that 5 are going to work because the blocks are solid colour, because they're being woven with the same colours as uh, are in the warp. But you don't have any clue what's going to happen with the other 20, and that's half the fun. So something like this, which has a very bright um, yellow in it, for me doesn't quite work, because the purple disappears almost. Yeah. But something like this is actually quite good fun. Yes, that's actually very harmonic, isn't yes, it? Yes, very. And uh, it's trial and error. It's experience as well, but it's trial and error. So samples like this are very valuable because they give us lots of ideas about what people were doing and about people's sense uh, of colour and of design at that point. So we have a, a couple of other pieces. We have this hand-woven um, blanket. We don't know the age of this, and this was given to us uh, by a local person. Uh, you can see that it's a very, fairly simple pattern, a diamond um, pattern, but what's unusual about this is, is actually the colour, because although it looks brown, it isn't, it's green. So it has a sort of olivey kind of green okay. tinge to it, and, and that beautiful brown. And I've never seen that colour again. I don't know what colour that is, and I don't know where the yarns came from. But if I show you something from Tullocks of Shetland, which was uh, another weave concern up here, you can see how beautiful the blending is in that, and how the, the rug actually glows with that white it does. in the middle. It does. Absolutely stunning. And you've, uh, re well, next year you're going to bring out a book called Shetland's Tweed Heritage, and this is a series of photographs, primarily, isn't yes. it? Yes. Um, of showing how there's some stunning tweeds in here, and how they um, are perhaps inspired by the, the flora and fauna of um, yes, Shetland. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because nowadays, of course, we're, we're all used to going out and taking photographs. But in the old days, you couldn't go out and take a photograph because you didn't have a camera. Mm. But you were definitely influenced by the colours that you saw around you and by what the markets wanted, by what people wanted you to make, and by the availability of dyes. So we suddenly see in the 1950s, uh, in the 80s of Vaux archive, that the colours get very bright and very vibrant. And that's because we've got new dyes coming in. Okay. But the traditional colours of Shetland are quite soft, quite muted up until that point. Um, they're not my favourite kinds of tweed because they're not bright enough for me. I like lots of colour. But they are very beautiful. 
So are you saying then, in a sense, the Shetland tweed has got more interest in the choice of colours than in, in the way they've combined patterns? Was there a limit to how, how many patterns or what kinds of patterns you could produce on the looms? Yes, because we were using four shaft looms. So basically we could do twills, which are diagonal lines. Yeah. Uh, you could reverse it to get a herringbone. You could do diamond kind of shapes like in this blanket here. Uh, you could do plain weave. You could do basket weave, which is where you uh, keep the same lift and put the threads through a number of times. But you can't do very much else because there are only four shafts and you have a, a finite um, amount of lifts that you can do, a finite number of lifts that you can do. That is one of the problems with uh, Shetland Tweed and why the industry disappeared. Um, okay. We didn't invest in bigger machines. Uh, we didn't invest in the wider width. Um, we didn't update. Oil suddenly came to Shetland in the 1970s. And, and it was, was a, ma a male-dominated was. field, wasn't it, weaving yes. here? So yes. that all the men just suddenly went out to sea to the oil rigs. Yes, men went out to sea. Um, women did too. Uh, they yeah. went out and, and found work in oil. It was a hard way of life compared to the oil. You could earn a lot more with, yeah. uh, with that oil money um, than you could weaving. Uh, weaving is a solitary occupation. It's not something you can do communally, really. Yeah. Um, it's quite noisy. I think it was untidy. It was messy. It was cold. The sheds were cold. Very hard life, but we've been learning about that from a few different sources, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think Shetland was probably... It was a hard life. It was probably a good life, but yeah. it, to us nowadays, it would have been tough. Yeah. So let's talk now about the stay and make program that you have. Mm. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the kinds of people who come here and stay and because um, they can stay for three, six months, can't they, in a, in a program? Yes, we've not had anybody staying for six. Normally we limit the stay and make to four. Okay. Uh, four months is a significant amount of time for anybody to give up a job or um, to go traveling. So four months is probably enough. So when people come here on a stay and make, they work for me for half the time that they're here and they work for themselves for the other half. The time that they have for themselves, they get to use the studio in its entirety. So they can use the looms, they can use the reference library, they can use the textile library. Um, we give them lots of business support and advice. We help them with yarns and things like that. So they get a lot of support. But the time that they spend working for me, we give them an industrial brief. And for a lot of graduate makers, and possibly some more experienced makers that come to us, it'll be the first time that they've actually worked to an industrial brief. And that's important. You need to understand how the cloth is made in order to design properly. So the industrial brief results in a series of samples and possibly three or four different iterations of sampling. And that sampling we refine um, together. It's a collaborative process. And we finally end up with a length of cloth that people have woven for us based on the samples that they've made. And that's their final collection. Okay. And you're going to show us some examples of people's progress, aren't you, from how they start and how they develop. So here we have uh, two different makers that came on our Stay and Make program. We have Edina Zeles, who's from Hungary, and we have Fiona Daly, who I spoke about before, who designed the throw that was over the back of the chair. They worked to exactly the same brief. The brief for this year was to look at Fair Isle, and to come up with uh, small knee blankets for us to produce um, in a limited edition. So the sampling process for this is uh, go into the archives, have a look and see what characterizes Fair Isle, um, understand a bit more about Fair Isle, and then come up with some samples. We then refine the samples together with the makers, and finally we end up with a collection of samples and finished pieces. We'll just go through some of the samples. You can see Adina chose the very strong colours of the heritage, uh, the heritage yarns, uh, Jemison and Smith heritage yarns, and these are her final pieces that she made. These are very strong colours, as you can see, and they don't suit everybody's interior, so I was a little unsure about actually putting these into any kind of production, because although they're very beautiful, um, they are strong, and our sensibility nowadays is to have 
rather more muted colours. So I kept them as an archive set and we had a big fashion house that came uh, to see us a few years back and they fell in love with these completely and put all of these patterns, these ones, these ones, these ones, all of them together in one piece of cloth and I thought this is never going to work. We wove it off as a piece of cloth, it was our first commission and it looked absolutely stunning. So we'll move on to, the, to our second designer. This is uh, Fiona Daly, who uh, actually trained as an embroiderer and now lives in Scotland, but she is from Ireland. And as you can see, she took the patterns of the Fair Isle and worked with uh, the patterns rather than just the colours. And she produced these small knee blankets for us. These are her final pieces in four different colourways. And I think... The interesting thing with these, all of these patterns, is um, how Fiona has put them together with different kinds of colorways. This is one of my favorites. This is, of course, Ferrar patterning. But on the back, as with Ferrar, you have lots of floats. We can't have floats in weaving because they catch on all sorts of things. And if you're using them for interiors or for fashion, uh, those floats will catch. So we have to work with this a bit more to actually get this pattern on the front and something else on the back. So a little bit more work is needed. As I said, Adina is from Hungary and Fiona is from Ireland. So she was trained in the Western European and Adina comes from the Central European kind of tradition. And that's why their colours, uh, their colour sense and their design sense is so very different. But both beautiful cloths, as you can see. So Andy, I want to thank you so much for giving us your time today. It's been such a lot of fun to get to meet you in person and to go around and see, have a tour of Global Yell. Global Yell is wonderful. If you get to Shetland, you must come up north to the island of Yell and visit it, spend a bit of time with Andy, learn to weave, or if you're already a weaver, get to weave better. So thanks so much for your time today. An absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming up and visiting us. We'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. <laughs>